Today, I want to share with you one idea, one lesson that we have learned when it comes to helping people can give you the maximum return. Some years ago, I was standing on this piece of land in Nakuru, Kenya. A couple had started an orphanage with two children. And by the time I got there, there were already 100 children. And the director came to me and said, I am struggling to feed these children. And he said to me, I have come to your country and I have seen on Sunday mornings ads of African children. And they're asking for $30 a month from somebody's credit card. And money is coming in. Can you go home? and find me 150 of your friends who can donate $30 a month. And I said to him, Jack, I live in Canada. There's 12 and a half months of winter. There's nothing we can grow there. Our children are starving. They're on TV every Sunday looking for the $30. I came home and I told my wife, I have a great idea. I said, I found a place where they can raise children for $30 a month, let's send our children over there. <laughs> it's too much money to raise them here back in Canada. Well, I didn't stop there. You have seen those ads. I came back and I asked the director, what stops you from growing a garden to feed the children? And he said, I have no water. I don't know how to do gardening. I don't have tractors. I don't have the things that are necessary. I said, we are business people. We want to make a long-lasting change here. Let's invest in this together. Six months later, that same plot of land turned into this. And our returns was this, happy, healthy children with dignity eating their own food. Let's call this Garden A. Remember this as Garden A. Armed with this excitement and success, we moved on to another village where we had just started working, and we told them, we want to plant a garden here because you're feeding children. They said, yes, be our guest. Let's plant a garden. So we did. And I went back, and I saw this drip irrigation. The garden was growing. I was so excited, and I told them I was going to go back home and bring some of my farming friends from Alberta so that we could expand this garden. So I came back, and this is what I saw. There was no garden. The garden was gone. I was so frustrated. I had brought all these donors in to help me grow this garden, and there was no more garden. So I called the people together, and I said to them, out of frustration, what happened to this garden? It was here when I came a few months ago. And they said, the elephants ate it. And I said to them, why didn't you tell me? They said, you never asked. You wanted a garden, and we said, okay, have the garden. <laughs> so I went back to my board, and I said, we had a great garden. I want you to meet the families that were fed from our garden. <laughs> they are very strong, and they are very, very fat. <laughs> this is garden B. What happened? What happened to garden A, and what happened to garden B? There was something missing. The investment was very good. It was responsible. Instead of giving the $30 a month, we decided to plant gardens. But there was something missing. That is the proven formula that I want to show you. Responsible investment alone is not good enough when it comes to helping people. You have to build relationships with people. That's what exactly happened in Garden B. We had not developed a relationship with them strong enough that they could tell us what their real problems are. Because poor people in this world do not have a voice. They take what we give. Therefore, building a relationship with poor people to give them a voice is the number one reason I think we have been successful. Let me walk you through a few examples of relationships and how it can help people. This is a typical rural village school in Kenya. We met the principal. It was obvious to us that they needed a school, and we planned to build a new school. And I said, I'll be back with some plans, and let's work together. 
When I came back, I saw this. The parents were taking turns already, sitting in the hot sun, breaking these rocks to build the foundation. They had already started a relationship with us. We knew immediately this would be a very successful project. And together we were able to, over a period of years, develop this wonderful school. But a few years after that, I arrived at the same school with some teachers. And while we were going into the principal's office, one of the teachers saw the report cards, the grades that the national exam had published. And this teacher noted and told me, there has not been much of a difference since the time you built this new school to the old school. The grades have not improved. Because we had a relationship with the principal, we asked the principal, why is this? You said a nice new building would make a difference in the education of these children. But what has happened? The principal said to me, the teachers are still the same. They have not received any more training just because you built a new school. We launched a training program to maximize our returns. There was a relationship enough that they had a voice to speak to us of the challenges that they were having. Let's look at this, something even more desperate. I was at this uh, place many, many years ago in Kendu Bay, Kenya, and I saw girls crawling like this from the school that we had built to the dormitory. They all had developed various kinds of physical deformities, in this case, polio. And we had everything with us to make these girls walk to school. So we approached the community and said, we have the money, we have the skill, we have the knowledge, we can do a surgery on these children for $150, and every one of these children would be able to walk. And the community came to me and said, no, you will not because we believe that this is a curse from God. What God has set aside as the, his will for these children cannot be changed by human beings. I was crushed. We had everything to make these children walk. They said, instead, give us some wheelchairs and give us some crutches, so we built a wheelchair factory and gave them the wheelchairs and the crutches. The investment was good, but not as good as it could have been. Time went by, and people started trusting us. They started bringing their children, and we started doing surgeries on these children, and they were able to walk because a relationship had developed to the extent that they were bringing worst-case uh, scenarios like this Janet, who had fallen into a fire. She was crippled. She was three years old. And the parents said, this is a double curse that God had put on her. But as time went by, we were building that relationship that hundreds of children started coming in for the surgery. Here is Janet, and she graduated from sky high school just a few years ago, and has her own little business, sewing clothes and selling it. Taking this success, we moved to another community and said, let's do this again. And it was very exciting because the word had already spread from one community to this community that you can trust these people because they have delivered. And this is not a curse from God. There are solutions for this thing. So when we arrived, we assessed the children and we found Festus. We thought, let's take a few children who has the most chance of succeeding, the least complicated surgeries. So we took Festus in and did a surgery and two days later he died. Here we were trying to build a relationship with the community to earn their trust. But what we thought was a very simple surgery, just a little pimple on his nose that had outgrown, we thought could be done in a few hours, but the boy had died. But the relationship that we had built with this other community was so strong that this community convinced them to allow us to continue working with them and you can see we even built a beautiful basketball court to encourage the children to have therapy. There's Dr. Trenchard, my former teacher, who teaches here with me a few months ago. 
even teaching them how to play basketball. The relationship had built so strongly that we were able to do this thing. Today we have done 10,000 surgeries on children all around this community. Not because we had the money and the skill and the knowledge and the people, but because we had a relationship to the community that they were willing to bring their children so that we could operate on them. The community then encouraged the government to begin a partnership with us. So we would always have a plan with the government. We would build phase one, and the government will build phase two. So the relationship with the government can also make helping people very, very useful. So here it is, the formula in a working model. Community, relationship with the better world, and the relationship with the government. So in all of the things that we have done, with all of the money that we have raised in 25 years, there's been nothing more important to get the maximum returns, the wise investment, as well as building relationships. In one of my early trips to Afghanistan, I learned a very important lesson. I was traveling on this SUV, and we had to cross this bridge. I was very, very scared. Not wanting to tell the driver that I was scared, I came up with the plan. I said, uh, Sam, listen to me. I want to take a picture of you driving on this bridge. <laughs> let me, let me get, get, get me off of here, and I'll walk across the bridge, and I'll take a picture as you come. And my friend and I got off, another friend on the back end, me on the other side. You won't be able to see my, uh, me on the other end of the bridge. So Sam drove across, and I took a picture. When he came to that end of that uh, bridge, I asked Sam, tell me, how did these people build a bridge like this? Two villages. And he said to me, very simply, bridges cannot be built from one side. These communities had to build the bridge together. So in a wider context, if you want to help people, building good relationships is how you can maximize your returns. Thank you very much.